So, today, we're going to be sitting here going right back in chapter 11. And I was trying to do as much as I can to go through each each one, but it's, it's sometimes hard. So, we're going to start on chapter 7, and we're going to actually make it through to uh, 15. Chapter 7, uh, I mean, not chapter 7. Chapter 11, verse 7 to 15. So, the, the title of it, I named it was, What Did You Go Out in the Wilderness to See? So that was just the same as the very first of the very, very first. But I wanted to start by reading back over like what we had already done. You know how I do sometimes. I like to read back so we can remember. So go back to Matthew chapter 11, verse 2. Matthew 11, verse 2. And... It says, and when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and, and said to him, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? Jesus answered him and said, Go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see, and the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended of me. So when you see right there, what one of the things you see is that John's question that he had put prompted Jesus to give these answers and get and actually discourse with the crowd, right? It, Perhaps some began to wonder about John's commitment to the Messiah in light of his questions. So Jesus explained to John that John wasn't weak or wavering in his thoughts. So we did talk about he had doubt, and I believe that everybody goes through doubt here and there, but that doesn't mean that he's wavering in his thoughts or wavering or weakness, okay? So... We look in, chat, in verse 7, it says, And they departed, and Jesus began to speak, saying to the multitudes concerning John, What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaking in the wind? As John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to ask the crowd a, rhetoric, a question. A rhetoric question. It says, What did you go out into the wilderness to see? He was asking, Did you go out in the wilderness to see John, a person who would be weak and unstable, a person who was easily swayed. You know, that's when you think of a reed shaking in the wind. It goes every which way. Did you think that when you was going out there, did you, you know, go out to see that because you thought he would be somebody that would be weak? No. Jesus is sitting there asking that question in a rhetorical sense, Right. He's asking the people, did you go out in the wilderness to see a person who could be easily pushed around or manipulated by others? We know that he wasn't manipulated or pushed around as the way we saw he acted towards the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He, Jesus is not saying that John is weak or unstable, but rather a strong, steadfast prophet who is not easily swayed by external influences. He was the wind shaking the reed. Is what one one of the preachers that I listened to, and then I was studying on his commentary. He says he was the wind shaking the reed. He was the one guiding people at that time. So, one of the things that I was looking at and and, and came across in, in my readings was it brought me to remember this. Just this one verse about reed shaking in the wind. Paul. The Apostle Paul tells the church in Ephesians, if you look to Ephesians, or just mark it down if you want to, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14, right? Paul says to that church in Ephesus, he says that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men or the cunning craftiness and deceitful plotness. So when you look at this wind, the people, the children, the, the people at that time, they were, they, the, the crowd was wondering, why is John asking these questions? And they were probably thinking in their mind, uh oh, so something's wrong here. We just, we already remembered John now, you know, how strong he was. 
and how he was the one that was bringing in the Christ, you know, being the, 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 the forerunner of Christ. He says, now all of a sudden, is he shaking in, in a wind? Is he, is, he's asking these questions. And Jesus is reaffirming to the crowd. You know, one of the, one of the things that uh, Jesus is also doing here, and I say this in a, in a, in later on, is he is another part where he's showing his supernatural ability to know what the crowd is thinking without. You know, he, the, the crowd is already thinking because they saw the, 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 the John asking those questions, so they're automatically thinking in their mind, is this the case? And so he sits there and he says, well, is, did you go out there to see a reed shaking in the wind? No. So this part in Ephesians with that, we shouldn't be shaking in the wind either. And, and so we should never have that happen to us, Paul says. And that means we shouldn't be easy influenced. And I know how easy it is when you get around a group of people and around a, uh, things that happen, circumstances. Many things happen in people's lives and it makes you to doubt. That's a normal part of our processes of living as uh, being a human. But we shouldn't be tossed to and fro. We should always learn to trust Christ and trust Him. And that's where we're leaning on Him and His things and what He tells us in His Word. So when we look at Matthew chapter 11, verse 8, it says, But what did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments. Indeed, those who wear soft gar clothes are in king's houses. So one of the things that, that I see right there, he wasn't talking about, what did you go? A lot of people today, what, what do people today go out to see? They go out to see like, you know, maybe presidential elections. Look what Trump had with all the, the things that happened. People run out to go see them. Did, did they go out to see that? No. They didn't go out to see something like that. So one of the things, they, they didn't go to see a president. They didn't go to see a ruler or a leader or a king. And that's what Jesus is asking them. Y'all didn't go out to see a king. Not out in the middle of the desert. And, and then look at the clothes. The clothes difference that I was, I, I, I looked at the pictures. Look at a king. At that time, they wore robes and all kinds of stuff, right? And it was all real lavish and, and, and richy. But now what did he come in? He came in with camel's hair and a leather belt, right? Which also is a symbol of Elijah because Elijah was a, the, a hairy man and had let, wore a leather belt. So, you know, Matthew uh, chapter 3, 4, like I was sitting there saying, he was the way he was clothed, just to, to show that, Matthew chapter 3, verse 4, it says, Now John himself was clothed in camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and honey. So Jesus is saying, and bringing that back up, y'all didn't go out into the wilderness to see a man clothed. You know, he's giving them the chance to think, why did y'all go out and see that? Jesus emphasizes that John's ministry was a like a self-denial type ministry that he had in preparation of the Messiah. His message wasn't about the pleasures of this world. Now, we know many preachers and teachers out there in this world today will have pleasures of this world, you know? And you, I don't even have to name those that you probably know, but that, that's about what you can get for today, what Jesus is going to do for you today in this world. I, I, I'm, I'm telling you, I look at the world to come is where I'm, I'm going with that. I don't look at this world trying to be blessed on this world. This world, I am blessed because I know the Lord Jesus. But at the same time, we're not going to all have it. Not everybody that has, believes in Jesus is going to have a wonderful life, right? They're, they're, it's not that. Because many people, if that was the reason why you go out there to go get a wonderful life, when the bad times comes, you're going to be doubting real quick about Jesus. So you didn't go out there for the... The, the lavish lifestyle or go out to see a king. So his message was not about the pleasures of the world, but about repentance and the need to turn from God. 
Remember him saying, he said constantly, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus is challenging the people to consider the motives behind their interest in John's ministry. Where they were looking for a popular figure, were they looking for a popular figure dressed in luxury, dressed in fine clothing and a luxurious lifestyle? Or were they seeking a true prophet of God who was to prepare for the Messiah? Now, anybody who would have been at that time that would have been just like we know Scripture that we read and we've heard and, and things, they would have themselves have heard some of the things that there was coming a, 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 a thing, a Messiah to come. And so when we look in Matthew chapter 11, 9, 11, 9 says there, it says, but what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say it to you, and more than a prophet. So when we look at this part right here, we go again and look, who would this and more than a prophet? They were knowing that there was a prophet coming. They knew that there was somebody who's going to pave the way. But what was it? So one of the things that I was bringing up right here is I think of Elijah. So they knew in this verse, and we'll, we'll see the rest of this in this verse, but we look. Here's one of the things that they would have seen. They would have known about the prophet Elijah because he was a very popular character in their, in their word. Matthew 3, 4 again, like I said, he says, And John came was, was clothed in camel hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locust and honey, right? So let's look in 2 Kings. You look at 2 Kings 1, 18, and here's a description of Elijah. This is so they answered him. He was, and this was when the, one of the kings was, was asking, this was after the, the prophets of Baal and that the, one of the, the king was sitting there asking, who was this person? He says he was a hairy man wearing a belt with around his, wearing a leather belt around his waist. And, he, and the king said, oh, that's Elijah the Tishbite, right? So you see the description. So they had probably already heard about this guy out in the wilderness, John the Baptist, who was dressed in camel hairs you know, there was a, a belt around him. So they already had that in their mind. I guarantee you that this, or many of them did, not everybody, but many of them did, that maybe this is the Elijah. Maybe this is before. So one of the things that I see and where we get that from, but what did you go out to see? A prophet, yes, but uh, more than a prophet. One of the things that we see in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3 it says, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way to make the Lord, make, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for your God. So they would have known what Isaiah would have said about him. Many people would, just like we know about the things that's happening today. We're so excited and ready for Jesus to come and, and to rapture many people when, when that day happens. Many people that are left here, they're going to know exactly what had happened because we had said that so many times, so many people. And, and it's going to come. In fact, it's, they're going to know it so well, they mock about it because they'll sit there and even say, when is the coming? When is his coming, right? So the people that, 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 that in this day and time, they'll, they, even today, they say they know about it. They mock about it, saying, when is his coming? And so these people would have known that part at that time too. So when we look at Matthew chapter 9, but what did you go out to see? Now, here we go again. I'm going to tell you. In Matthew chapter 11, 9, the Jesus asked the crowds what they went out to see when they went to go see John in the wilderness. He suggests that they went to see a prophet, confirms that John was a prophet. But Jesus goes out on to say that John was more than a prophet because he was the one sent to prepare the way for the Messiah. So one of the things he was sent to prepare that way and, and, and the, for the Messiah, and we'll see that right next in Matthew chapter eleven ten. 10. It says, Jesus does not openly, like I said earlier, what I was, what Jesus, what I, what I said earlier, where this is where I was. Jesus didn't openly, openly expose their, the secret suspicions of the people, but he rather addressed their hearts to show the, that he knew the hidden things, Right? So just like I said earlier, Jesus knew what was all on their thoughts. And can you imagine how seeing a man 
know, see so many things that so many times he could sit there and know exactly what you were thinking, what the crowd was thinking and answer people's questions without them even asking the question. But in their hearts, they were. We still talk to the Lord today. And so that's sort of a form of way we talk to the Lord. That's a way that, that he was answering them right there, showing that he was the Lord by knowing those things. So we look in Matthew chapter 11, verse 10. For this is he on whom it is written, Behold, I will send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before who will prepare your way before you. So that's a direct quote from Malachi, pretty much Malachi chapter three, verse one. And let me read that. Malachi chapter three, verse one, the coming messenger. Now that's not what it says, but that was the beginning of my, where I had it in my Bible. It says, behold, I send my messenger and he will prepare the way before me and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. Even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. So like I said, that's the quote from Malachi. It's also significant because it in, in, one of the significances is it's got a divine commission there. John the Baptist didn't choose that ministry. John the Baptist didn't choose that. He was chosen. Out of all the people, out of everybody in the world, that God, you know, God knows you before you're formed. He's the one that actually forms you and makes you in your womb. He knows everything about you. So out of all the people, He chose John the Baptist to be that one that's forerunner, to bring forth that. And, and that is... An amazing role, an amazing thing. John's role as a messenger of who prepared the way for the Messiah was not his own choosing, but was appointed by God. Similarly, Jesus saw himself as the one who was sent, who was sent the fathers. Jesus saw himself as the one who was sent the father to accomplish sent by the Father to accomplish a specific purpose, and he was obedient to that purpose. Let me tell you how that works. So not only did John the Baptist go out here, he was sent, God picked him before time. Jesus, which is God, but he come down in the flesh. He knew that he had a divine mission to accomplish that he would have to die on that cross. And it was even unto the death. He was obedient to it. So let me make sure I think I missed one. So one of the things that uh, I was writing, so how to, how to say that part, what I just said. Jesus said to them, if you look in John chapter 4, verse 3, 4, verse 34, Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. That's what Jesus said. Another part in John 6, 3, or 6, verse 38, Jesus says, for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And John chapter 8, verse 29, and he who sent me is with me, the Father has not left me alone, for I always do the, those things that please Him. So as we see right here, not only did John the Baptist have a specific thing he was chose for, but so did Jesus. Jesus was, had a specific thing. So that's a, good, that's a, a, a neat way of, of looking at things right there. So obedience to God's will is evidence in the accounts of Jesus even evidence, when we talk even to the death, even evidence of his uh, crucif accounts on the crucifixion. So if you look in, in the Garden of Gethsemane, right, Jesus prays to his Father, and this is in Luke chapter 22, uh, 42, says that in, he prays to his Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. 
Despite his human reluctance, Jesus was willing to submit to God's will and to offer himself up as a sacrifice for, human, uh, sacrifice for the sins of humanity. So one of the things that I was looking at is I was comparing, how did John the Baptist have a, a way versus how Jesus had a way? And so one of the things I was thinking about, and it's just something that I was, I was thinking when, when Jesus sit there, he says, if you are willing, remove this cup from me, right? He's asking, the, asking God. And you remember, we got always remember, it's about God's will. We a lot of times pray things, right? But if it's in the will of God, then that's how things get healed or, or how things happen. It's got to be in his will. So Jesus was even right here sitting there saying, if it's, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Now, John the Baptist, he was a great man, and we're going to learn about that. But one of the things he said right here, he says, are you the, are you the coming one, or do we look for another? He's asking a question here also. But he's not asking him in the sense that, is it his will or something like that? He's basically just putting an answer, a, a thing. One of the things that we should always look at is a will. Is, is, is God's will for us to be healed? Or is it God's will for us to, to, to do whatever it is that we're asking for? You know, and so we should follow our, our Lord and be just like him. And, and I'm not criticizing John the Baptist on that right here, but you can see that doubt that was in there. But in, in Jesus' thing was not a doubt. It was just a will. Do you get what I'm trying to say? Do you get my, what I'm, 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 I'm trying to put forth? What John said made people doubt, made people think in their, in their mind that there was doubt that John the Baptist was doubting. But what Jesus says wasn't any kind of doubt. It was just by what God, whatever your will is, Lord, I'm going to still do it. But this, so that was kind of in my head. That's where I was thinking. And so I, I just wanted to bring that to you because we want to make sure that when we do things, we do it in the form of his will and not that we would have a doubt or anything. Even though that's hard for us because we're human that's a hard thing for us, and we all follow that. I don't think anybody in this room could ever sit there and say that they haven't had some circumstance or something that happened that made them, am I doing the right thing here with following the Lord Jesus, or am I doing this? I think everybody has, you know, they believe, but they're like, they're, God, the Satan always tempts us to go against the Lord Jesus, always trying some which way. So we look in Matthew chapter 11, 11, he says, Assuredly, I say unto you, I say to you, among those born of women, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist, but he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So well, that's, that would be really good for John the Baptist. God's saying that there's not been one. That means Elijah wasn't better. That meant Noah wasn't better. That meant... Moses wasn't better. All the people, he was the greatest of all of those, right? And so he's telling the crowd again, he's holding the crowd saying, look, there wasn't anyone better than John the Baptist. And, and, and we can go in back and look at all the different places where you can go and look where there was like many people had doubts all through. You can look at, like, even with Moses. Why wasn't Moses going in the, in the promised land? Because he struck the, the rock twice. He, he was only supposed to do exactly what the Lord said. Every one of us have our faults. And out of this, that being him, him being in prison, I mean, you know, he was in prison, and that would have been something that would have been terrifying to a lot of people. You know, wouldn't being locked up. And, and yet he was, reason why he was put in prison, because he went and told... He went and told Herod that he couldn't have his have his brother's wife, you know, as, as a as a companion. He couldn't have that. And they, you know, he was being bold to go to the king. How many people would go up here to a king or somebody, especially in the Middle East nowadays, and say, "Hey, you can't do this because you're doing it. What's what's wrong in God's eyes?" And you know, many people would be like, 
yeah, well, you know, <laughs> that would be a rough time. So anyways, one of the things that it also made, you know, wanted to share with the way he was with John the Baptist and talking about how bold he was. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 7 through 10, John the Baptist says, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come in to his baptism, he said to them, you brought of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentances and do not think to yourselves that we have Abraham to our, as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now the ax is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Now, John the Baptist was very bold in what he said. Very bold. You know, I was sitting here thinking also about other people and, and him talking about the greatest. And, 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 you know, even Elijah. Elijah went and had all the prophets of Baal, right? He sat there and he called down fire from heaven. Now, just being able to see some of the things, the miraculous things that, that, that he saw, that John the Baptist would have saw, that many people, you know, uh, he sat there and he called down that fire, right? And that fire come and, and consumed the, uh, you know, the altar and he ducked it with water and everything so it wouldn't burn, right? And then if you look at his doubt that he had, as soon as that happened and he slayed the 400 prophets of Baal, they all, you know, they all danced around, nothing could happen. He slayed the 400. Oh, I think Jezebel, she sat there and says, I'm... By this time tomorrow, you're going to be dead. And so what does he, him, after seeing all this, he runs and goes into a cave and tells the Lord, just take my life now. Just take my life now. Like I said, the greatest of all prophets all have had doubts. And Jesus is sitting here saying, but John the Baptist is the greatest of all of them. Right? But then he tells us, look at us. Right? He says... But who is the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So where I was just saying that part about Elijah. One of the things that I was sitting there saying about Elijah, because of this great ministry in preparing the way for Christ, John is declared to be one of the greater of the prophets. He's positionally greater, not morally, though. John the Baptist was great morally as any man born of woman, but as but as to the kingdom, he but as to the kingdom, he but announced it as a hand, right? The kingdom did not come, but was rejected, and John was martyred, and the king presently crucified. The least in the kingdom is the least in the kingdom when it is set up in glory will be in the fullness of the power and glory, right? So one of the things, however, Jesus also makes an interesting point by saying that the least in the kingdom is greater than John. This means that even though John was the great prophet, those who are in the kingdom of heaven, believers in Jesus Christ are even greater. This is because they have been saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Now, that's one of the things I was wanting to get to a point. We haven't seen what Elijah did. We haven't seen what Jesus did. We didn't see him there in the flesh. We, don't, we, we haven't been able to see those things, yet we believe. And one of the things right here, let me tell you what Jesus says. And so look at the faith that God has given us so much more then he give them men right there. He's given us even that much more faith. Now, now he tells, talks to Thomas. You look to John chapter 20, verse 24 through 29. Now, Jesus sits there and uh, is talking to Thomas. And he says, now Thomas called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when the Lord Jesus came. And the other disciples therefore said unto him, we have seen the Lord. So he said to them, unless I see his hands 
and the prints in his nails, the prints, print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came to the door, being shut, being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here and touch my hand, and reach here and put, put it into my side. Do not, be, do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So now do you see where those who are the least in the kingdom, now we may not have had a very significant role in God's kingdom this coming, but we're greater than those because we get to believe and trust in Jesus without even seeing him. And so that is a wonderful thing. We haven't seen those nail prints. We, we've, heard, we've heard stories. We've read our Bible. But we haven't seen it. But yet we believe. What a great thing that Lord has done for us to, 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 to put us there. Now we look in Matthew chapter 11, verse 12. And it says, From the days of John the Baptist until the kingdom of heaven suffer violence, and the violent take it by force. So one of the things that I was looking at that, when you look at, at, at those things, at that verse, what all happened from the days of John the Baptist, so I'm assuming from the day he was born, from the day he started, one of the things, so you look at some of the things, just some examples, some examples of, of uh, sorry, just some examples of things that happened that were by force during that day from the days of John the Baptist until the kingdom of heaven suffer violence and take it by force. One of the things that happened, there was a threat of infanticide, right? Do you remember when Jesus was born, King Herod threatened all the, the babies and killed all of them in Bethlehem? That was pretty violent. They had to fly, they had to have a flight to Egypt, right, to escape. Jesus was rejected in his own hometown of Nazareth. Right? And they wanted to throw him off the, off the cliff. The opposition from the rel religious leaders throughout his ministry he faced all those days. His betrayal of Judas. Right? He was betrayed by Judas. He had false accusations. Right? He was called blasphemy. He even called Beelzebub. Called the devil. The king of the devils. Right? And then he suffered his physical death. John the Baptist, some of the examples that was that, he was imprisoned, you know, by, by Herod Antipas, right? He was then beheaded. And he was also criticized being attributed to uh, demonic possession. You know, they say that he, one of the things that, that we'll learn later on in this verse, they said, it says that, you, you know, I came eating and drinking, you say, you know, that I have, uh, I'm a, a glutton and have the devil in me. And so did John the Baptist, who wasn't eating and drinking. And he was sitting there in the way he was, and, and you, you claim he's a, got a demon in him. So right here, when we look at Matthew chapter 11, 13, and 14, it says, For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to receive it, he is Elijah who is to come. Now, we learned about that last week, and we learned a little bit about what it was talking about if you are willing to receive it. A lot of people weren't re willing to receive it. I believe God would have set his kingdom up right then if the whole nation would have been willing. But at that time, they weren't. And so Christ knew, and Christ, he could have had another plan, but he, his plan worked out exactly the way it meant to go. But he was still, this was his, his uh, thing. So one of the things, John's ministry was to prepare the nation for Jesus, for Jesus and to present Jesus to the nation. If you look in Luke chapter 1, verse uh, 
15 through 17 and John chapter that uh John chapter 1 29 through 34. So let me look at Luke chapter 1 through 15. It says for he will be great in the sight of the Lord and he shall drink neither wine nor strong drink and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God and he will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So then we also look at he had had the people received John's witness and accepted their Messiah. John would have fulfilled the prophecy, prophecy literally. Instead, they're for, they're, they're, instead, they were fulfilled in a spiritual sense in the lives of those who trusted Christ. Jesus made it clear in Matthew chapter 17, 10 through 13. Let's read this part right here. It says in chapter Matthew chapter 17, 10 through 13 says, And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then do the scribes say Elijah must come first? And Jesus answered and said to them, Indeed, Elijah is coming first and will restore all things. But I say to you, Elijah has already come, has come already, and they did not know him, but he, but did to him whatever they wished. Likewise, the Son of Man is also about to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he spoke of them, spoke to them of John the Baptist. So it took a minute for them to realize that, but in Matthew chapter seventeen, you see that that. It, Elijah did come in that sense. And I mean, uh, John the Baptist was Elijah in that sense. Many, uh, now, now I kind of feel this way too, but I'm reading this through Warren Wearsby and what he was talking about. And this is where I'm getting this part. He says, many Bible students believe that Malachi 4, 5 will be fulfilled literally when it comes to Elijah as the one coming, as it comes to, to the one who uh, the two witnesses spoken in Revelation, so I believe that also. I believe that Elijah will come be one of those two witnesses, and see in Malachi right here it says Malachi four or five. Just to give you that scripture, it said, "Behold, I will send to you the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord." Now that great and dreadful day of the Lord is that's going to be the part right there during the tribulation. It even says so uh, that. They will even go out and, and 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 kill them in the thing. So we look in Revelations chapter eleven, four through six, and these are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before God, of the before the God of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, they must be killed in this manner. These have the power to, now I underline this part because this is one of the reasons why I believe Elijah and Moses are the two that are going to be the two witnesses. It says, these have the power to shut up heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy and that they have power over water to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all, pl all plagues often as they desire. So one of the things, Elijah was recorded as having prayed for a drought and it did not rain for three and a half years. So it's funny how it didn't rain for three and a half years right there. Also, this is going to be at the same time we're looking at the three and a half years and the, another three and a half years. So if you look in the, uh, 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1, And Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there shall not be near dew nor rain these years except by my words. Now, when I say Moses, one of the reasons why I believe Moses is because right there you see, and they have the power to turn the waters to blood, right? One of the things Moses is noted for was turning the water to blood. Moses turned the waters of the Nile and other bodies of water in, in Egypt to blood. In Exodus chapter 7, verse 14 through 24, 7 says, Thus saith the Lord, By this you shall know that I am the Lord. Behold, I will strike the waters 
which are in the rivers with a rod in that my hand and they shall with my hand and they shall be turned to blood. So another thing that also kind of convinces me is that when we look at Jesus's transfiguration, right? When he was transfigured before the three of the disciples, he says there and it says that in Matthew, if you look in Matthew chapter 17, verse three, it says, and behold, my, Moses and Elijah appeared talking with him. So when you see, you put all that together, it just, to me, that makes sense that that would be. A lot of people say Enoch because he didn't die. And, you know, it's suffered once man to, to, to die. You know, and, and, and also we know Elijah didn't die. He was taken up in a fiery chariot. So a lot of people will say that. But one of the things when you look at that, there is times where people have died twice too. Look at uh, Lazarus who was raised from the dead. He had died. He was in the grave for four years. And yet, it doesn't. we don't have any account of him just going up like Elijah or Moses. He would obviously have died again during a regular death of old age or whatever it was. And many people, it says he raised a little girl from, from death. So we don't see these people sitting around. So doesn't necessarily mean that, that you won't have, because these people died twice in their lifetime, right? But not only that, Another thing that, that makes me uh, think about, in the Old Testament, during the, before the flood, there was no Judaism. There wasn't anything about Judaism. It, uh, Enoch was what you would consider a Gentile. We didn't even have Judaism until Moses and all of that came through Abraham and that. So, and, and actually, during this time of tribulation, during the, those times, those, those people are, it's concerning, the, the whole tribulation is concerning the Jewish people. So a, a Gentile coming in, being one of those, just doesn't make as much sense. The more you realize it. And so that's one of the reasons why, you know, I, I kind of believe that. Now we're here at chapter 11, verse 15. And this is where I, I ended it today was, uh, and it's pretty much, this verse speaks for itself. It says, he, he who has ears... To hear, let him hear. So every time we sit there and we speak about the Bible or speak about God actually gives people ears to hear. But are your ears open, you know, to hear God's word? A lot of people shut up God's word as soon as, as, as they hear it one minute. They don't even want it. In fact, even in later on, it says they don't even want to retain the knowledge of God in their, in their head. And many people don't want to hear it. They don't want to know it. But one of the things that, that, that and, and this came while, Matt, this is one of Matthew's Bible verses through a school that he has to uh, learn. And I heard it, and it was like right at the same time that this, so it was like, this was a, 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 a good verse, and I felt like it meant the same thing, or it meant close to it. It says, Isaiah 55, 6 and 11, it says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and, his, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and, our, and to our God for he, is abundant, he is, for he will abundantly pardon. So if you have ears to hear, now's the time to hear. Do it while the Lord is near. There's going to be times when he's not going to be found. Many people go out and say, I'll wait and I'll wait and I'll wait. And then when, when I get close and I've enjoyed my life, then I'll, I'll go to the Lord. Well, he may not be found. Do it while he's near. That's what it's saying. Seek the Lord while he may be found. He, God wouldn't have put that there if he, if he could always be found by every person at every minute. Many people, if you look at Pharaoh, several times Pharaoh hardened his heart. Later on in the verse, you see God hardened his heart. Pharaoh had no more choice in the matter. He may have thought he did. He may have thought he could have. But he didn't have that choice at that time. And so call upon him now while he may be found. So... 
Let's pray. Now's a good time. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you. We come to you and we just ask you, Lord, thank you and we thank you. We just pray that if anybody needs you, Lord, if they need you in their heart, that they would turn to you, Lord, while, they, while you may be found. Lord, that we just ask that if anybody who ever hears this may be listening to it, that you would just, just turn, to, turn their heart to you, that come and help them, to, that they would seek after you and find you, why that you may be found. Lord, let us have ears to hear that we know your word, Lord. Let us to come and trust you, Lord. Let us lean on you for that understanding. Lord, we thank you. I know that, Lord, there may be times where we may doubt you, may doubt that we're doing the right thing or, or anything of that matter. But, Lord, you've showed us through examples that that's not a new thing, that you're able to overcome all of those obstacles, Lord. You're able to overcome those things. That if we will seek you, we'll be able, you'll find us. And we, you'll come after us, Lord. That you love us and you, you care about us. We thank you for all your many blessings. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. All right.